Quinoa has a, a fairly recent history in North America. Um, it was first really grown on a, a large scale in the 1980s in Colorado. And um, really, it, it, that, there's one farm that's been growing it there for about 30 years. But in like the past five or six years, it's really kind of taken off. Um, Washington State University uh, is really doing a little the really uh, cutting edge research on it. Uh, and I was uh, lucky to be part of that from the beginning and joined on uh, at Lundberg after I graduated. So this is all fairly recent, but the, the history of Quinoa in North America is, is um, actually full of a lot of failures. And this represents what we've learned from those failures and a few successes. Um, a lot of this grows on from the, the great work that uh, Bill and Trinidad did last year, um, as well as my graduate work, and kind of what we found for quinoa um, elsewhere worldwide. And, and uh, some of the few studies that have been done on it. Next slide. So first off, a, a short bit about quinoa. You know, what, what, what is it actually? It's not technically a grain because it's not a grass. It's a broadleaf crop. So it's uh, classified as a pseudo cereal like uh, buckwheat or, or amaranth. Um, so, but it is grown for its seed, like similar to a grain. Um, it's native to South America and it's fairly ancient as a crop. It's been grown at least uh, 7,000 for 7,000 years. Um, and overall, it's, it can be very adaptable in some ways, but it's also very susceptible, particularly to heat and, and some pest issues. So it's, it's very tough, but very sensitive in others. Next slide. Um, here's a close-up of a quinoa seed. If, if you haven't looked at one closely, they're kind of coin shaped with a little bit of a uh, small tail, that's what they call it. And the embryo wraps around the outside of that coin, and that's what um, will sprout. You know, as it germinates, you'll see the root come out of that, that little tail there. Um, the center is where the starch is at. So that's just a short bit of anatomy of the seed. The seeds are coated in what are called saponins. Um, they're a bitter compound that help keep birds away. And also mean you don't want to eat quinoa from the field if you're, if you're out there. Um, when I was a grad, graduate student in Eastern Washington, we'd always pop, you know, developing wheat kernels in our mouths and eat them, and they're nice and sweet. I did that with quinoa and I had a sore throat for two days. It's uh, some pretty, pretty uh, uh, bitter stuff. And, and uh, that gets removed on later in processing, so you end up with a nice, you know, uh, non-bitter uh, uh, quinoa to cook with, but uh, it, it, it kind of helps keep birds away. So if that's one concern, uh, uh, the saponins help uh, keep that uh, being a problem. Uh, with, with quinoa, variety selection is everything. So if you were to plant quinoa from the store, uh, this is one of the few places where it might actually work in a few situations, but th they will likely fail to set seed. Um, they are, are dependent on day length to, to flower, and, and when you, they're growing during, during the, the long summer days here, they'll, they'll just grow really tall, like about 12 feet tall maybe, and, and fail to flower and set seed. So you need to get a very specific subset of quinoa varieties from uh, southern Chile. Um, they're grown at a similar latitude south as we are north, and so they're the most adapted to growing in the United States. Um, kind of the second key thing about quinoa variety, quinoa needs cool temperatures, and that's why it does so well uh, here in coastal locations. And, and out here, uh, temperatures of 95 degrees or over can sterilize the pollen, and you can end up with a, what looks like a great plant vegetatively, but there'll be no seed in it. So you need those cool temperatures for that seed set. Um, even sustained temperatures in the lower 90s can be damaging um, if it hits it at the, the right period. It's very sensitive to, to heat stress. So it, it's it really having it be successful, is a, uh, it's crucial to have the right combination of variety, climate, and, and planting day. Uh, so here is uh, an overview of the highest temperature on average that uh, locations get uh, during the year. And as you can see, you know, and, and out here on the coast, it's quite a bit cooler because you have that ocean influence. And this is one of the reasons why quinoa grows so well. You, you don't have these high temperatures in the mid to upper 90s. Um, you, you know, it, this is going to vary quite a bit as you go further inland or you have certain microclimates, so it won't, may not hold for the whole, whole coast. But uh, this, this is, you know, this is quinoa land, looking at this map here. Uh, you know, for going up and down the uh, California, Oregon, Washington coast, you know, the, it's these numbers that I look for. Um, and there's strong parallels between this region and where those varieties from Chile that we, we grow, um, that they have almost identical climates. And on the next slide, you can really see, see that. This is uh, from the, the weather station in San Gregorio and one from Concepcion, Chile, which is kind of the heart of where those quinoa varieties from Chile come from. They have this cool uh, Mediterranean type climate. Um, you, you have a dry period in the uh, summer, late summer, which is crucial when your crop is maturing and the seed's getting done, because um, you don't want your seed getting wet, uh, so this is any green. Um, you have mild temperatures during the summer, so you're not going to have any sterilization. And oh, one thing that's quite nice is you don't have hard frost, so it allows you to plant earlier. So um, you really have quite a white, white growing season here, which, which makes it quite, um, quite great. Um, 
So when, when do you want to plant clean well? Well, there, that comes to two factors, and I, I wish I could give you a date, but it's all going to depend on your particular environment. You know, things are, are pretty variable, but um, cold temperatures is, is the first one. You're, you're very likely, from what I understand, to uh, not likely to get a hard frost out here, and it's probably going to be more your soil temperature. Uh, would be a constraining factor. And you want that to be at least 50 degrees Fahrenheit. <coughs> Otherwise, uh, you can have uh, a lower germination rates. So you want your soil to be warm enough. Um, and then the second one would be waterlogging. If you plant it before heavy rain and the, the, the seedlings get, get waterlogged, that can kill them off. So you want to have it, you know, your soil's warm and workable um, and, and not too wet. So we have a really wide planting window, as I mentioned. Um, and some of you may be able to plant early. Uh, driving up one, I saw some fields where you work. So uh, looking at this, this climate graph, I was thinking maybe mid-April, but for some of you, that might be earlier uh, when, your, when your soils are ready. Um, so that provides you with some multiple options. And I kind of foresee two, two particular ways that you could plant it and, and go with the season. Um, the next slide goes over the first one. It looks like you could get a, an earlier planting and grow a dry land by planting with your seasonal rains. Um, I know the past few years have kind of been anomalous as far as um, uh, kind of drier conditions year round. So, so this is going to vary from year to year for sure. But um, it looks like you know early spring if you can plant it with those rains. Quinoa has a deep root that that uh, taps into soil moisture. It, its method is to you know it, it starts in the spring and sends its roots down quite deep. It actually kind of uh, uh, dampens down its shoot growth, so it stays quite small. And it's just trying to get that water. Um, and if you can reach that, then throughout the rest of the summer, it, it's fine. You, you, it requires no irrigation. With cool temperatures, it's actually the most drought tolerant crops we have, so it's, it's uh, quite, quite drought tolerant. Um, estimated uh, harvest time is about 120 days after you plant. All of that can vary quite widely with um, your, your, uh, your growing environment. Cooler temperatures will extend that, warmer temperatures will speed that up. But that would put you in a harvest date well within the drying period, so, or well within the dry period of the summer. Harvest. Um, next slide. Uh, and the second one would be a, a later planting, and then that would require irrigation just to get the plant started. If you uh, are past those seasonal rains, then, um, then you know, it'll need some water to get started. The advantage is you're not waiting it, uh, for, for rains to come, so it allows you some control over um, uh, when, when, when it will emerge. And, uh, I, I think I kind of made the connection with Bill a little late, late uh, last year, so this, this, his ended up getting planted about mid June. And it finished early October, so it did work really well. Um, definitely got it in before, before it rained. Um, but this could be kind of a second window if, uh, if you're looking for later planting and that fits in well. Uh, there, there are two main planting strategies for quinoa. Uh, one is to do wide set spacing, and the other one is to broadcast. Wide set spacing is great because you can cultivate between the rows. So if you have a weedy field, definitely this is what you want, what you want to do. Because quinoa, as I mentioned, stays short. Uh, and weeds can easily compete with it. Uh, if you do have a, a less weedy field, you, you can't broadcast it. Um, in, in either situation, the seed's quite small, so you need to seed it shallow. Um, if you have heavy soil, you want to uh, seed it a little bit uh, more shallow, just because you can't really push through heavy soils that well. Um, and if you have a lighter soil, then you want it to be a bit deeper. And most crucially, it needs to reach moisture during the early stage. If it dries out, it, it won't come up. So, Kind of reaching that moisture and planting at the right depth are, are quite key. And having uh, precision seeders, uh, uh, if, if you do plant it for is, is absolutely vital. So the wide spacing, um, you, you can get by with less uh, less seed just because you do control the depth and you can target where that, your soil moisture is. Um, so you can plant around as low as 10 pounds an acre. Um, you can actually we've, we've planted quite a bit lower than that and still have really good results. Um, up in Humboldt, one of our growers, Blake, has planted as high as 17 pounds an acre. It's got a super, a very ultra-dense crop, which matured a bit early. Just with those extra plants, you know, they all kind of competing for moisture. It didn't affect yield, but it did cause them to mature a bit early, so um, definitely an advantage to if you're looking to get your crop uh, uh, in early. Um, it requires, this, uh, like I mentioned before, it requires a cedar with a high degree of precision, because you, you need to get it at that rate. Um, anything that, that's used on um, vegetable seeds, you know, that, that's used to handling a small seed, that's likewise, you know, needs to be seeded at the right depth, that uh, can work well for quinoa. So um, that can be an advantage of that, you know, that put on hand. Next slide. Right. 
Hmm? That, this is the next slide. Oh, oh. White spacing. Oh, okay. Um, so, so as I mentioned, you know, we control you have that white spacing. Um, and you, know, uh, you see here that the plants are quite small. As they grow up in height, they'll form a canopy <coughs> which blocks that many weeds uh, between them. So that, that, that happens as soon as they start to shoot up in height, um, you get that nice closure. And as soon as you reach that point, you don't have to worry about weeds anymore. So you, you know, have a deep, deep exhale at that point. And then uh, with broadcasting, you want to you want to seed a bit heavier, about 15 to 20 pounds an acre, just because you know you're gonna have seed placed at multiple depths, and you want to make sure you know uh, suddenly some of it's at that at that right depth. Um, after the seed's broadcast, you, know, you want to roll it in so it is get kind of pushed down into the soil. Um, and, and here on the right, this field is amazing. It does look like it has a few bare spots, but quinoa has an amazing ability to branch out. So there's areas where germination is spotty, and you have maybe plant. You know, if you're a, a foot away from another seedling, and they're really small, you're like, how ah, am I going to get anything? Um, later in the season, you'll be amazed at just how, how wide they can branch out and uh, take up space. So that's one of, one of the great things about quinoa. Uh, and just, just to continue on that, um, they did two experiments in Europe to see what, what were the optimal densities for uh, yield. And they found they were stable, the first of the experiments, between 121,000 and 1 million plants per acre. It's almost uh, uh, 10 times, uh, and then the second round they found 430,000 to 2.2 million plants per acre yields were stable, so it didn't, didn't really matter. Um, so if, if you do have a denser stand, it's going to mature a bit earlier. Uh, if you have you know, spotty, uh, spotty germination, you're going to have larger plants, which may take a little bit longer to, to, to dry up. But, uh, uh, as I mentioned, quinoa is slow to grow in height, uh, stays small, focuses on building its taproot to, to get moisture. Um, but as soon as that, that tap root's uh, uh, developed um, and it develops kind of a small reserve of leaves, you'll see a flowering bud in the middle of the, the plant. I think the next slide has a photo of that up close. Actually, the next. Oh, actually, sorry. Go, go, go back. What was that? It's <laughs> a bit further ahead. Um, it'll, it'll form a, a flowering bud. And then right after that's formed, then you have rapid shoot growth. And it, it's quite amazing how quickly it, it grows up in height. Looks um, like. Uh, a quick note on fertilization, there's not much research that's been done in the, in the U.S. Um, growing in coastal locations or uh, 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 you want to get around 70 to 120 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Um, that's what they found in Colorado that worked best, uh, but there, there hasn't been you know, any, any experiments to, to, to that particular um, amount down. And it's a great scavenger for nutrients, though. So if you have fertilized a vegetable crop before, it can actually get by on that. If you fertilize it really heavily, the plant will grow quite tall in response. And if you don't fertilize it enough, it can be stunted. So um, if, if you have it too tall, it's going to lodge, it can be difficult to, to combine. If it's shorter, then you're going to see hits and yields. So you kind of want to target it uh, the best. Um, and, uh, in the coast and in Colorado, you know, they, they did I think, two tons of chicken litter per acre um, uh, in Humboldt worked really well, and then four tons of chicken litter per acre worked well in Colorado. So um, it's, it's going to kind of take uh, take knowing what your soil, baseline soil fertility is like, what the history of it is, and, and, um, and then also what uh, uh, resources you have available. So, uh, here's an experiment for planting we had in Humboldt, but this just kind of shows the progression of what the plants look like over time. So this was planted April 28th, so this is about three weeks in. As you can see, the plants are still quite short. I'll that slide. Uh, they're still quite short two and thirds. So this is like a week and a half later. Uh, they're, they're kind of building that rosette of leaves up, and they're going to start um, uh, building that uh, flower bud, uh, floral bud next. Next slide. So this is a close-up. On the left, look, that's what the seedlings look like. So after you plant, you want to see a row of something that looks like that. Uh, and these two initial seed leaves, and then your second pair of true leaves comes on at a right angle. And then here on the right, that's where you have that nice rosette of leaves in your central flower bed. So if you see a bunch of plants looking like that in a row, you're, you're in shape. Um, and next, so this is that same field on June 20th. So as you can see, they're about over a foot tall now, and they have, they have the floral growth going. And the next slide, this is July 28th. So this is chest height, about, about four to five feet. Ultimately, these plants were taller than I was, so uh, they, they, they can go quite tall if they have the resources and fertility. This is a close-up of what flowering looks like. So here on the left, you can see it's pollinating. You see those little 
uh, yellow dots. The, it has, has star-shaped flowers, so you have about five, um, five stamens and five anthers on them. And so once you start to see that, then you really want to look at your temperatures and just make sure you're, you're having cool, cool conditions throughout that period. Um, on the right, it, it's kind of hard to see, but you can see seeds developing in those little star-shaped flowers. And uh, as they develop, they kind of push back with those little sepals, and you'll see these, uh, the, the seeds appearing. So this is a, uh, uh, multicolored varieties. There's black and brown seeds on this plant, but um, uh, the white varieties are the most white seeds growing. Um, and you, one thing I do is just continually check them to see how bad they are. So I pop them out and do what I call my fingernail test. And as soon as those are hard, then your, your seeds fully mature. Next slide. Uh, oh, a few, a few notes about pests to watch for. These haven't been problematic in coastal areas yet. Um, it, it seems like when you do have heat stress, the pests can multiply quite rapidly, but um, they seem to just be present at low levels. Um, I know Bill produced a few predators for, I think, uh, beet armyworm and then the aphids. Those are the two that showed up out here, but they, they never really became uh, an issue. Um, but the, the four main pests are stem borers, aphids, ligus, and armyworms. So I have photos of them. Just, just something to keep an eye out for. Uh, if you do have them in your plants, or you do see them in the chemo field, like my plants here. So next slide. Uh, these are stem borers. I haven't seen these yet on the coast. We've mostly just seen them in the Sacramento Valley and up in uh, uh, eastern Washington State. Um, but the, the main sign for these is you see these brown patches in the leaf axles, and that's where the, the larvae are, 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 are they're pupating and, and exiting the plant. Um, here in the bottom right, you can see they're actually eating the inside of the, the, the pit of the plant out. Um, and on the next slide, I think I have a photo. It causes the tops to wilt because it's taking up that vascular tissue. Um, it's losing water to the top, so that kind of destroys the ability of the plant to, to produce seed. Here on the left, you can kind of get a brown if that happens later on. Um, if the, you know, the, the flower's a bit stiffer, so it's not going to wilt, but it just, just loses some um, uh, connection to the top of the plant. Um, but like, like I said, I haven't seen this on the coast yet. Next slide. Uh, Ligus, Bill, did you see these anywhere? I don't remember seeing them myself. Ligus bugs, I, I've actually seen them almost everywhere except here, so. <laughs> Yeah, so, so these we've seen everywhere. That there, there's quinoa. We saw some up at Humboldt, which is you know, very close to our, our coastal production last year, and, and they never it really exploded. It was just you know a few here and there. Um, but they, they feed on the, the developing seeds when they're still still doughy. They're a piercing sucking insect, so they uh, they stick their stylet inside the seed, and you can end up with, with empty seeds. Um, if you go to the next slide, I have uh, these are the nymphs. So what I do is I just take the inflorescence and kind of knock it against my hand, and, and th those young ones will come out in your hand. And Really see how, you know, uh, how, how many young ones you have and what you might expect. But um, yeah, these, these generally just need heat to, to really get going. Next slide. Uh, aphids, there's two types. I think uh, Billy saw the leaf roller aphid here, so those are kind of on the underneath. So if you see, especially towards the bottom of the plant, they, they just curl under. And if you uncurl them, you'll see these, these aphids that uh, they, they call them pseudobugs. Um, ladybugs are a great control for them, and if you don't have them naturally, you, know, you can certainly supply them. But uh, uh, you know, quinoa fields have quite a bit of ladybugs in them, uh, just, just from my experience. Um, and then the other aphid would be the one pictured here, a black bean aphid. Um, they cause kind of the plant to dehydrate, um, and you can also have some quality issues with the, the honeydew. Um, the habits in these also have problematic levels at um, coastal locations. And then army worms. Uh, I have seen these in Humboldt at a later planting date. And Bill saw, I think, yeah, Bill and uh, uh, Dad saw these, um, I think, I forget exactly when, but they, they feed on the developing flower bud, which you want to keep intact, you know, if, if you're going to have seed production. So they can be pretty damaging. I think if you planted them earlier, you, you'd escape them. From what I understand about their cycle, they're from Southern California, and they kind of make their way north because they're not, because uh, they're frost sensitive. So as soon as temperatures start to uh, warm up, they, they kind of start to migrate north. Um, so I, I'd say if you, if you don't have a later planting, you'll have some protection against these. So, uh, and then also downy mildew, this also isn't a problem, but if you do notice some splotchiness on your leaves, that's uh, downy mildew that's kind of present on all the seeds, on the, on the weedy relatives of quinoa, so you can't, can't escape it. But it hasn't been problematic in the west coast of North America because we have, the west coast of the United States, because we have dry summers. Um, even with the fog, it doesn't seem to be an issue. We really need warm, humid conditions. Um, so chemo planted on the other side of, of the country certainly gets impacted by this. But uh, uh, this is helpful. If you do overhead irrigate, 
continually, multiple days, and you do kind of create those human conditions, you can start to see this growing. Um, but uh, if you feel out to dry out in between, then you, you uh, uh, reduce that possibility. Um, and then as far as maturity too, so, so if your plants are growing up in height, the next stage is, is of course maturity, they're going to set seed. And as they mature, they start to turn some quite brilliant colors. And it all depends on the variety. So the one up on the, the upper right is cherry vanilla. And that one turns this deep cherry color. Um, it, it's, it's really quite, quite astounding. Uh, it really depends on the variety. We have another one called Oro de Valle, which turns this rich gold color. Uh, we have a multicolor mix that turns all sorts of shades of the rainbow. So um, visually striking. Um, once the seeds finished maturing, and, and I think I mentioned before that they do the fingernail test, if it's hard between your fingernails, and you're just waiting for the plant material to dry down, that stays wet while the seed is done. So what you're really looking for is for the plant to turn a tan color, for that, that color to then go away, for the, the, the leaves to get crispy and dry down, and get fully senesced. Uh, when that's the case, then you can go through the combine and direct harvest it. Um, and the guides that are all in your folders, um, the, the BMP guide, um, I'll talk a little bit about swapping. I don't think that'd be necessary here because you do have such a wide season and you can um, uh, just direct harvest them and you have enough a, a leeway. But uh, that, that's, uh, uh, yeah. that's a photograph bottom right of, uh, of Bill's cherry vanilla crop being uh, combined. So that's kind of what it looks like when, when it's ready to, to be, be harvested. And next slide. Uh, as far as uh, combines, any combine that's used for small grains can be used for quinoa, so you just need to get smaller screens, make sure your fans aren't up too high because it is a small seed and you can blow quinoa out the back as my first research project in grad school uh, was. Uh, so <laughs> make sure everything is dialed up right. Um, uh, and also, if you do use a combine that has a, 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 that's been used on the small grains, you want to make sure that you get all the wheat or barley or whatever crop was there previously because it is a quinoa crop. So just from a quality perspective, Make sure you don't have any of that growing in your field as a cover crop that might come up with your quinoa or that's present in the combine that might be um, stuck in any uh, uh, groups here that, that might be in the uh, combine. So, yeah, so next slide. I think that's the last one. Thanks for listening. Also, thanks to Bill Cook and, and Sharon Dad for you know, uh, uh, taking care of it. I, I learned so much from them about how quinoa does here. It's always different in different places, so um, it, it's, it's really enlightening, and I appreciate the opportunity to see how it does. I think we'll make questions for the end, so.